two apocalyptic eruptions at the Yellowstone supervolcano 639,000 years ago plunged Earth into volcanic winters, during a time when the Earth was in a relatively warm phase, and hominids were venturing further north in Eurasia. This date is also an important milestone in human evolution, as we will discuss later in the video. Researchers had earlier revealed that the supervolcano sitting under Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming could erupt sooner than expected. But new evidence sheds light on the last eruption that occurred 639,000 years ago and what happened after that. In fact, Yellowstone's supervolcano reflects our fascination with extinction and rebirth. The new study suggests that two powerful eruptions occurred 639,000 years ago and 170 years apart. The two powerful eruptions sent a massive amount of ash and sulfur dioxide into the sky blocking the sunlight from reaching Earth's surface and causing the global temperature drop. The eruptions plunged the planet into two distinct volcanic winters. In fact, scientists discovered here that they're the two ash-forming super-eruptions each cooled the ocean by about 3 degrees Celsius. They came to this conclusion after they found two distinct layers of ash bearing the unique chemical fingerprint of the supervolcano in the seafloor sediments in the Santa Barbara Basin, off the coast of Southern California. These layers of ash are squeezed among sediments that hold a geological record of ocean and climate change. The study of ash and sediments together revealed that their two separate super eruptions that led the planet out of a major ice age also interrupted a natural process of global warming, according to the researchers. The scientific team also found that the onset of the global cooling events was abrupt and coincided precisely with the timing of the supervolcanic eruptions, the first such observation of its kind. We see planetary cooling of sufficient magnitude and duration that there had to be other feedbacks involved, especially in the northern hemisphere where ancient humans called Homo erectus were living. This ash fall deposit, widely distributed over western North America, records the massive explosive volcanic episode that formed the present vast Yellowstone volcanic caldera, one of the largest of the last 23 million years. This tephra has been directly compared with a climatic record with decadal resolution that demonstrates that the volcanism was precisely coincident with and therefore likely the cause of two episodes of abrupt sea surface cooling of tilde 3 degrees Celsius. Each of these volcanic winters lasted at least 80 years. Volcanic winters of this duration are significantly longer than most models predict based on atmospheric dust and sulfur loads, and suggest involvement of positive climatic feedbacks including oceanographic effects. These cool episodes also suggest that the global climate system was highly sensitive in response to such events during deglacial transitions. It goes without saying that a volcanic eruption of Yellowstone today would be a disaster for humanity and plunge the world into a volcanic winter. The fact that these eruptions occurred during an interglacial, such as we are in today, is even more chilling. If these eruptions had happened during a glacial climate, state scientists may not have detected the climatic consequences because the cooling episodes would not have lasted so long. The idea of a mega-volcano destroying civilization brings up some interesting questions. Why are we so fascinated with death and destruction, and why is this event so important in human evolution? Around the same time as the Yellowstone eruption, humanity split in two. One group evolved into us, evolving in the warming climate of Africa. The other adapted to the cold climate of Europe, becoming Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. They weren't our ancestors, with the exception of a little interbreeding, but a sister species, evolving in parallel. London's Natural History Museum says Neanderthals and modern human lineages separated at least 500,000 years ago, but the date of the divergence has also been estimated to have occurred closer to 650,000 years ago. This is strikingly close to the Yellowstone super eruption dated to 639,000 years ago. Recently, Swedish geneticist Svant Parbo was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his groundbreaking work on the genome of humanity's extinct relatives, including the Neanderthal. The Nobel Committee said Dr. Parbo had accomplished something seemingly impossible, sequencing the genome of the Neanderthal, our recently extinct relative. We think of Mother Nature as being warm and cuddly, and for the most part, she is, but sometimes the savagery of Mother Nature is revealed 
on the earth, 99.9% .9 of all species eventually go extinct. Extinction is the norm. Interestingly, as we have covered in other videos, major geological and environmental events, such as volcanic eruptions, interglacial warm periods, and magnetic pole reversals seem to coincide with important dates in human evolution. The species Homo neanderthalensis shares an unknown common ancestor with our own species, Homo sapiens, but it's unclear exactly when the lineages diverged. Homo sapiens evolved perhaps 300,000 years ago, according to the fossil record, while Neanderthal's evolutionary timeline has proven even trickier to pin down. Some genetic studies suggest that their lineage split from our own as long as 650,000 years ago, but the oldest definitive fossil evidence for Neanderthals extends back only about 450,000 years. To help to take a bite out of that gap, scientists use detailed morphological analyses and micro-CT scanning techniques to painstakingly measure 450,000-year-old teeth from a cave. The teeth were then compared, inside and out to those of other ancient human species, revealing that they have Neanderthal-like features. With this result and other studies, it seems now evident that the Neanderthal lineage dates back to at least 450,000 years ago and maybe more. This age is much older than the typical Neanderthals, and before the study it was unclear to which human fossil species these Italian remains were related. Indeed, this is an interesting study demonstrating that many of the features of Neanderthal teeth are present in Europe as far back as 450,000 years ago, which is farther back in time than Neanderthals have yet been identified in the fossil record. But this pushes back the hard evidence of the split of Neanderthals from modern humans and is entirely consistent with the divergence dates coming from ancient DNA analyses, which suggest that the divergence occurred before 450,000 years ago. However, the story isn't as simple as a fork between modern human and Neanderthal lineages. Rather, the ancestral tree of the genus Homo appears very complex. There are other European fossils of comparable age that lack the Neanderthal features of these Italian fossils, and therefore indicate that other kinds of humans, besides Neanderthals, may have been present in Europe during this period of time. One species in particular has been suggested as the possible common ancestor of both Neanderthals and modern humans. During the Middle Pleistocene, another species called Homo heidelbergensis was present in Europe, and its relationships either with Neanderthals or with more archaic species like Homo erectus are still unclear. Together with the Denisovans, Neanderthals are our closest ancient human relatives. Scientific evidence suggests our two species shared a common ancestor but despite decades of research this last common ancestor, aka the missing link, has eluded archaeologists. The exact date and location where this last common ancestor lived are still the subject of controversy. Current evidence from both fossils and DNA suggests that Neanderthal and modern human lineages separated at least 500,000 years ago. Some genetic calibrations place their divergence at about 650,000 years ago, around the time of the Yellowstone volcanic winter which would have created population bottlenecks in colder regions of Eurasia. Both dating issues and fossil anatomy mean that scientists are currently uncertain whether the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans was Homo heidelbergensis, Homo antecessor or another species. During the past decades, our image of Homo neanderthalensis has changed dramatically. Initially, Neanderthals were seen as primitive subhuman brutes, but increasingly Neanderthals are regarded as basically human. New discoveries and technologies have led to an avalanche of data, and as a result of that it becomes increasingly easier to pinpoint the differences between modern humans and Neanderthals. Nonetheless, Neanderthals fascinate us because of what they tell us about ourselves, who we were, and who we might have become. It's tempting to see them in idyllic terms, living peacefully with nature and each other. If so, maybe humanity's ills, especially our territoriality, violence, wars, aren't innate, but modern inventions. Biology and paleontology paint a darker picture. Far from peaceful, Neanderthals were likely skilled fighters and dangerous warriors, rivaled only by modern humans. Indeed, 
Some would even argue that we are being fed sentimental, anthropomorphic images of our big-headed Neanderthal rivals. Predatory land mammals are territorial, especially pack hunters. Like lions, wolves and our own species, Neanderthals were cooperative big-game hunters. Other predators, sitting atop the food chain, have few predators of their own, so overpopulation drives conflict over hunting grounds. Neanderthals faced the same problem. If other species didn't control their numbers, conflict would have. What's more, this territoriality and cooperative aggression has deep roots in humans. Because many Neanderthal fossils and artifacts have been found in caves, the species became synonymous with the idea of cavemen. But many early modern humans also lived in caves, some of the most famous examples being the Cro-Magnon Man from France, 